The criminal justice system as it exists now is very, very punitive, historically punitive. We're punishing people who themselves have experienced a great deal of victimization. Welcome to New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. We have a couple of on-location uh, episodes in the works right now, so in order to buy ourselves a bit of breathing room, we are uh, revisiting a previous episode on, uh, on today's show. It's a, a conversation that's um, been in the background for me, actually, with just about every episode we've produced since uh, making this one. The conversation is with Bruce Western. He is a sociologist at Columbia University. Um, the conversation is about re-entry, life in the year after prison. That's the subtitle of his uh, 2018 book we focus on, Homeward. But moving backwards, that means it's also a conversation about the harms of incarceration. And it's about deprivation, instability, and violence, the problems and life histories that leave people vulnerable to the criminal justice system in the first place. Ethically, you're going to hear Western ask, what are we to make of a system whose default response to those problems is jail and prison? As you'll hear, Western has a very different and much more hopeful vision. So here's my conversation with Bruce Western. I started by asking him about the study that's at the heart of his book, Homeward. That's the Boston Reentry Study. The Boston Reentry Study was motivated by a lot of research I'd been doing over the past 15 years or so, trying to understand the consequences of incarceration, how people do in the labor market with their families, with their health and so on, after they've been in prison. I was analyzing big data sets and I, I was concerned that the kinds of empirical materials I was working with wasn't really providing me with a very granular understanding of the whole social process of this transition from prison back into the community. And I thought I really needed to try and get into the field and get close to the problem, speak to people who were making this transition from incarceration uh, to community. Uh, The idea of the study was to begin interviewing people one week before they were released from prison and then follow them over the year after release as they went back uh, into the community. We had a sample of 122 people. The only criteria for eligibility was that you were returning to a neighbourhood in the Boston area. So we interviewed men and women. We're in minimum security prisons. We're in maximum security. We're uh, in solitary confinement units, uh, talking to people behind plexiglass in non-contact units, and then we would meet with them two weeks later after prison back on the outside in the community, and we followed their lives uh, over the following year. Are there generalities that you can make about um, this population as as a whole in in terms of um, life history experiences? Yeah, uh, some things were very, uh, very striking to us. Nearly everyone uh, we interviewed grew up poor. And so uh, although the study was uh, covering the entire Boston area, we're really in a a handful of neighborhoods. And the footprint of the criminal justice system falls overwhelmingly in very poor communities of color. In many cases, there was a, a history of exposure to violence and trauma. I have to say, we weren't fully anticipating uh, going into the data collection, and uh, people were struggling in uh, in different ways with uh, mental illness and, and drug addiction, and they were they were the real threads. They were the biographies that people were bringing to this process of reentry of this transition from prison to community. You have this concept I was struck by um, of human frailty, uh, which really seems to be where we get into sort of 
what, what is kind of the ethical concern uh, of the book, because um, you've spoken about wanting to have a more granular understanding of, of people's lives. So could you explain a bit more about what you mean by this concept of human frailty and how it plays into people becoming involved with the criminal justice system and incarcerated? The idea of human frailty, I guess, at, at some level is an elaboration of the idea of poverty, how we think about very deep material hardship. And when people like me, sociologists, talk about poverty, uh, it's narrowly an income concept. But what we were seeing was that people who were growing up in poverty with very low incomes were also dealing with uh, a host of other problems that included things uh, like growing up in a very chaotic home life, which exposed people to the risk of uh, victimization, witnessing a lot of violence in their childhood. People grew up with poor health uh, and poor mental health, family members also struggling, uh, and a lot of housing insecurity, also in childhood, but sustained uh, over the life course. So human frailty, uh, for me, was a cluster of disadvantages, a cluster of adversities, some of which took a very bodily form. And this added to the insult of poverty. It put people at risk uh, of contact with the criminal justice system. Which then exacerbates these problems. And which exacerbates these problems. And it it makes the process of reentry and finding your place in a community again after incarceration, that much more difficult. Did you anticipate when you started work on this project that it would, I mean, in my reading, expand and do something that's actually quite bigger than just looking at this one year after prison? I mean, did you initially imagine it would be a much more contained argument in some senses? Be- because of the type of research I, I had done in the past and the kinds of data I was looking at, I think I had a, a fairly simplistic idea of the kinds of things people were struggling with before they went into prison and then uh, after they got out. And they were things like having a really low level of schooling, in many cases having dropped out of school, often uh, living in a poor neighbourhood and uh, in many cases a a racially segregated neighbourhood, so where poverty was, uh, was very concentrated. As we got to know people uh, and as they opened up to us about their lives, we were hearing a lot more than that. We were hearing about uh, trauma and violence, uh, about addiction, about mental illness, much of which uh, went untreated uh, for long periods of time and suffused family networks. I, I, I think it gave me a much richer understanding of the very harsh conditions of American poverty in which the safety net is uh, is very thin and provides very little support uh, to poor people. Uh, in a sense, this, this portrait that you're offering of the people that you studied is making how we think about criminal offenses you're much more complex. Um, you're, you're really complicating the simple binary between good and evil, guilty and innocent. But if we look for a moment specifically at the question of violence uh, and people experiencing and witnessing violence in their early years. I was really struck by the statistic of uh, 40% of people in your survey had witnessed someone being killed. Yeah, it's uh, extraordinary. I mean, that's just an extraordinary number. So how, how do you think your findings uh, complicate how we think about people who have been convicted of, of violent offenses? Yeah, I, I mean, th- for me, this was one of the really eye-opening aspects of the research. I felt through this work we had gained some window onto a world that was just shot through with ethical ambiguity. And because of the different kinds of material hardship that people were dealing with, they were very often put in situations where They had to make choices, but in many cases, those choices were never very good. Violence, in some cases, became functional, became a a, a way of dealing with problems, very difficult problems. And I think this is very different from the moral universe that is contemplated by our criminal justice system. 
which tend to divide the world into innocent victims and guilty offenders. And uh, guilty offenders prey on innocent victims. And the job of the system is to mete out punishment and separate uh, offenders from victims. But in uh, the world of the Boston reentry study that that our respondents were were sharing with us, you couldn't divide the world into victims and offenders because people uh, who had, in, in some cases, committed acts of serious violence, for example, and and gone to prison for them, had very serious histories of victimization themselves. They'd witnessed a lot of violence themselves and. I think the violence we observed uh, in many cases was of a very contextual kind, uh, which meant that people were growing up in chaotic homes. They were living in neighborhoods that were very high crime, uh, very high crime areas. And it makes me think if you had grown up in that family or if I had grown up in that family, we would have been exposed to a lot of violence in our lives too. And we may well have become quite seriously involved in violence as well. But I suppose, what would a criminal justice system look like that was designed to respond to the kind of trauma that you're talking about? Obviously, as you acknowledge, the system as it's built up now is uh, certainly not built to respond uh, to complexity. So I'm, I'm wondering what you would say to uh, a skeptic who might say, hey, that's just not the lane of the criminal justice system. It's about public safety. It's about uh, uh, accountability. For me, there are two two big implications. One is, I think, we have to take really seriously uh, the life histories of trauma that people have experienced. And, and we have to understand uh, the ways in which that might affect their decision making, their time horizons, and uh, things like that. Uh, we have to adapt our programming to be trauma informed, as uh, as the experts say. So that's one piece of it, and I think we're we're not very far down that road. The other piece of it goes to jurisprudence and uh, uh, how we think about punishment in our criminal justice system, and I think if we take on the histories of victimization, the exposure to violence over a lifetime of people who are in state prison, I think it opens the door to greater leniency and compassion. And it's challenging, it's difficult to take account uh, of moral complexity. But I think uh, we can think about how these kinds of very difficult life histories can be mitigating in punishment. Uh, the criminal justice system as uh, it exists now is very, very punitive, historically historically punitive, and we're punishing people who themselves have experienced a, uh, a great deal of victimization, and, uh, and I, I think we need to take stock of that ethically. So as we move in this discussion somewhat chronologically towards this um, reentry year and the year after prison, could we talk a little bit about what you found was the effect of prison uh, itself on, on, on your respondents? We're, we're speaking today in the midst of a quite remarkable uh, national prison strike, one um, calling for, among other demands, an end to deaths by incarceration. So I'm just wondering, what, what do we learn about the experience of, of prison by focusing on the difficulty of reentry? I, th- I think we can think about incarceration in two two distinct but related ways. And we often think about incarceration, and certainly the justice system does, as a deprivation of liberty. But a different but related way of thinking about incarceration is as a disruption and distortion of human relationships. When people are removed from their communities, removed from their families, there's going to come a point when they're released when they're going to have to reestablish all of those social connections again. And it's a very unusual social process and it doesn't have uh, many parallels because it also carries the baggage uh, of a a criminal sentence, the stigma of uh, a criminal record. So 
at a very, very fundamental level, what's the effect of prison? The effect of prison is the creation of this problem of having to return, having to reestablish and find one's place in uh, society again. I could say a lot more about what people experienced in prison. A lot of the prisons that we went into were disorderly. People felt unsafe. There was fighting. There was drug use. Programming was often in in short supply. People had unmet health needs, uh, unmet uh, mental health needs. Uh, A lot of people reported to us anxiety, depression, PTSD as a consequence of their incarceration, all of which creates obstacles to returning to communities. Yeah, if, if, if we now focus on this transition year, if we want to call it that, this year after prison, and your portrayal of prison itself as being a kind of community eroding institution, um, something that takes away already often fragile social ties and community bonds, which are so vital to people's social lives, what are the primary obstacles in a, in a very concrete way, I guess, to two people's year of uh, re-entry? Um, and then what, what were the markers of, of success, if we can call it that? Three primary obstacles really stood out to us. Income, housing, and health. People had very, very low incomes. Uh, so $6,000 on average in the first year after incarceration. So that's about half the federal poverty line for uh, an individual uh, living alone. And so there was a lot of material hardship that uh, accompanies those very low incomes. Housing uh, was an enormous challenge in the first year after incarceration. And so there was no independent housing at all that we observed across the entire sample in the first year after prison. And that meant that people were either doubling up with family, uh, which was mostly mothers and grandmothers and uh, aunts and older sisters, so the older women in people's lives. Uh, And so most were uh, doubling up or they're in uh, some sort of transitional housing uh, and some were street homeless. Uh, So housing was an enormous problem. I think one of the policy challenges is not so much supplying more housing for prime age single men who are coming out of prison, uh, but trying to find ways to support the households uh, that these men are uh, often returning to. Uh, We found there were lots of positive effects of living in a household. So even if you're doubling up in your mother's house, there were all sorts of positive effects of being in a private household as opposed to a shelter, say. And then the third thing, uh, people struggled a lot with their health. And uh, Back to this human frailty question. Uh, exactly. And so there's a clear empirical connection in the data uh, between histories of exposure to violence and trauma in childhood and poor health uh, in adulthood. And partly this meant uh, a lot of mental illness, a high rate of mood disorders like depression and anxiety and some serious mental illness, um, uh, psychoses, bipolar disorder, and uh, physical disability. Uh, people were in, uh, in poor physical health, uh, so uh, chronic pain, a high rate of chronic pain in the sample. Uh, some of it was related to drug use, uh, arthritis, uh, back pain, and a lot of diseases of poverty, uh, diabetes, asthma, uh, things like that. Chronic conditions which people had to manage in an ongoing way in addition to everything else you have to do when you come out of prison and try and make a home in a community. And are there some um, generalizations we can make about people who had more successful reentries? I mean, what were markers of uh, people doing better in terms of community ties and reintegrating? Although the picture I'm painting is very challenging, some people did really well. I think family support was uh, very important, particularly for housing. Uh, Families were an enormous support. And employment as well and uh, was a real marker of success. Uh, So the unemployment rate across the year was about 50%. So in any given month, about half the sample had not done any work. But more than just employment, skilled employment in particular, uh, 
uh, was really important for people doing well. But very hard to attain. There were, so there was a small group of white men who got union jobs in the construction industry. And uh, uh, union hiring halls in, uh, in Boston, so that lifted them over the hurdle of a criminal background check in, in hiring. They had skills, uh, they had training, uh, and they were well paid. And in some ways, that to me is what successful reentry should look like if people are able-bodied and uh, can be given skilled work that pays well significantly above the minimum wage. And most of the employment we observed was at the minimum wage. But if people can live significantly above the minimum wage, uh, then they can be out of poverty, they can support a household, they can pay taxes. They, the, the union guys got retirement benefits, which I think allowed them to look to a future. And um, most of the rest of the sample in that first year were in survival mode. So if you have support from a, an institution, say like a union, uh, or um, obviously if you have support from family, not just the stability of housing, but the stability of social ties in general, it seems like, for you were uh, a, a marker of, of, of someone having a more successful reentry. I think you found people who were greeted at the prison upon their release by family members yeah. tended to do better than people who weren't. This was also a bit of a, a revelation in in the research. A, a lot of people in the, the first week or so were telling us uh, about welcome home parties. And we sort of got very interested in, you know, what happens on the first day out, the second day out? Is someone throwing a party celebrating uh, your return? And uh, for people who were very socially isolated in that first week, so they weren't uh, meeting with uh, relatives, they weren't actively engaged. Uh, they tended to do worse six months later if they were very socially isolated immediately after they came out of prison. And we've touched on this issue of race, which I want to ask you about now a little bit, speaking about these older, generally white um, union uh, workers who tended to fare better. But when you're writing about this huge social institution of mass incarceration more generally, you you say that it you see it as the driver of a, a kind of new kind of racial I inequality. And, and I wonder why it's important for you to say that it's a new kind of racial inequality. Obviously, it's building upon a much longer one that's sort of constitutive, arguably, of this country. But what were you finding were how, how reentry challenges played out differently by race? The really striking finding uh, for us was in the labor market. So there was a very large employment gap between white respondents and uh, black and Latino respondents. And the white men that we were interviewing did significantly better in employment than the uh, the black and Latino respondents, even though they tended to be older, they tended to be in poorer health, and uh, they had in uh, a higher rate of uh, mental illness and, and drug addiction. Despite all of those disadvantages, they were financially much more secure and independent after incarceration. And... There were racial differences in the sample, but people's pathway into prison was different. Uh, for the black and Latino respondents, they tended to be younger. They tended to have had problems at school. Uh, they tended to have dropped out of school. And it seemed to us that incarceration in their case was very much the product of blocked economic opportunities, very limited economic opportunities in the communities in which they were growing up. For the white men we were interviewing, they tended to be older. They had uh, long histories of drug addiction and mental illness. And in their case, this looked much more like uh, the product of a public health crisis among low-income white men. And of course, um, overlaid on all of this, there's a very large racial disparity in incarceration. And I think disadvantage, economic, socioeconomic disadvantage is playing out in a new way in this era 
of uh, very high incarceration rates, which has been with us now for a generation. Why is it important to say that this is new? Because I think we're dealing with a a post-civil rights reality and uh, we're in a world in which discrimination in racial discrimination in public accommodations, in the labour market, in housing markets, in credit markets, is now illegal. And there were strong expectations that anti-discrimination protections would open up full citizenship uh, to African Americans and they could join the structure of mainstream opportunities of the rest of American society. And it didn't happen. And why did all of these anti-discrimination protections not open up uh, the full spectrum of opportunities to African Americans? And, you know, shortly after the passage of the Civil Rights Act in the 60s, the criminal justice system turned in a much more punitive direction uh, and prison populations began to grow. And so the Civil Rights Acts were uh, succeeded by an era of mass incarceration, which was facially colorblind. You didn't have statutes that prosecuted blacks and whites differently in the black letter of the law. But the effect of uh, the punitive turn in criminal justice policy had massively uh, racially disparate effects. So within a generation, among African-American men who dropped out of high school, about two-thirds of them wound up in state or federal prison. And then turning just uh, turning to look at, at, at women and their experiences in prison and, and the difficulties of reentry, there weren't uh, many women in your study, and you can talk about the reason for that, but y- you write that the experience of women throws the injustice of incarceration into its sharpest relief. There were 15 women in our sample of 122. Uh, as we got to know them over the, uh, the course of the year, they shared with us very, very serious uh, histories of victimization. They struggled uh, mightily uh, in nearly all cases uh, with mental illness and addiction. The problems that they were facing, which was a significant part of their path into prison in, in the first place, the challenges that they were facing were much more serious uh, than we saw among the men. The histories of victimization were were so striking to us and in most cases began in early childhood and were sustained over a lifetime. Uh, none of the women uh, we interviewed had been convicted of uh, serious violence. Uh, uh, that was confined to the men in the sample. That mirrors patterns in, in national, uh, national statistics. You know, earlier we were talking about you know, the, the ethical complexities of the social world and of people that go to prison, I, I think those complexities are most serious, most serious for women. Uh, the criminal justice system fiction that divides the world into good people and bad people, innocent and guilty, victims and, and offenders, that world completely dissolves when we think about uh, the women in state prison. So I, I wanted to end, actually, with this question, the kind of ethical concern that I think runs right through the book. And it's, uh, I think, captured in the the title of the last chapter, which I think is criminal justice as social justice. I, I guess it's a huge question, but if you could unpack a little bit here w- what you mean by this notion of criminal justice as social justice. And again, bearing in mind the skeptic who might say, uh, look, you're asking the criminal justice system to do too much. It, ha- it should have a more limited role. The incarceration that we learned about and the biographies of the people who were incarcerated were intimately connected to three social conditions at the bottom of the social hierarchy of American life. One is deep poverty, and poverty doesn't just mean low income. It's it's coupled to all the challenges of, of human frailty. One is deep racial inequality. Uh, so in many, many cases, uh, we're talking about very disadvantaged communities of color. And 
The third thing is the violence that arises in these contexts of racial inequality and deep poverty. We have responded to those uh, social conditions with a, a very harsh regime of punishment that's created the largest penal system in the world. How do we retreat from it? How do we reverse mass incarceration? Well, we should shrink the system. Will that be enough? Will that speak to the harsh conditions of poverty uh, that we observed through the criminal justice system? Just shrinking the system, will that uh, make those communities flourishing and healthy and give people opportunities that are widely enjoyed by the mainstream of American society. I don't think it's enough to shrink the system. I think we need to be thinking of ways of how people can be reintegrated into the social compact in the aftermath of harm and, and violence. What does that imply for policy? I think it means there has to be a role uh, for things uh, like improving people's economic opportunities, their educational opportunities, making their housing more secure, making their family life more secure. All of that contributes to the safety of communities and helps reintegrate people in the aftermath uh, of violence. Is this beyond uh, the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system? I wonder if we should be redefining our terms. I wonder if we should be thinking about not a criminal justice system, but a justice system. What set of institutions can help promote fairness, uh, human flourishing, uh, social cohesion, uh, a rich community life in American society? And some of those institutions will look like uh, something like traditional criminal justice agencies, but some of those institutions will look very different, I think. And this is what you mean by by creating a thick public safety, I mean, as opposed to the sort of thin public safety that we arguably have now, which is created by this culture of punishment. We look at safe and flourishing communities, and, and why are they safe and flourishing? Is it because there is a uh, a, a, a vigilant police force that is uh, maintaining order on every street corner and, and meeting out harsh punishment to uh, all sorts of deviants. And that's not uh, what makes uh, uh, flourishing communities safe. Uh, what makes them safe is a rich institutional life, order and predictability in daily life that's provided through employment and families and community organization. And so I think we have to develop ways of building all of those social and community bonds that provide order and predictability in daily life, allow communities to flourish. And the tool of punishment fundamentally, I think, is corrosive of that project. It destabilizes uh, social bonds. Uh, and so retreating from mass incarceration, I think, will involve building a very different set of supportive institutions. Well, Bruce, I, I want to thank you very much for your book, first of all, which I just found enormously thought-provoking. Um, and then, of course, thank you very much uh, for being here today. Oh, thanks for this conversation, Matt. Thank you. So I've been speaking with Bruce Western. Bruce is a professor of sociology at Columbia University and the co-director of its Justice Lab. He's also, of course, the author of the book from the Russell Sage Foundation we've been discussing today, Homeward, Life in the Year After Prison. If you enjoyed this episode, you might want to scroll back in our feed a bit to listen to the recent discussion I had with another sociologist, Patrick Sharkey, at New York University. Uh, we talk a lot in a similar vein about the wider effects of violence and the real meaning of public safety. Technical support uh, today provided by the inimitable Bill Harkins, and our theme music is by Michael Aaron at QuiverNYC.com. For more on today's episode and all of our work, visit our website, courtinnovation.org. And this has been another episode of New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. Thanks for listening. <laughs>